Visitors, and welcome to the NK News podcast. I'm your host, Jacko Zwetslut, and today it is the 6th of July, 2022, and I'm joined here via Zoom from his home in Austria by researcher Dr. Bernd Schäfer. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you to please leave a review about this podcast wherever you can. Spotify allows ratings, but not reviews. Apple podcast allows both, and on YouTube, you can like and subscribe. Secondly, uh, check out nknews.org and consider buying a subscription. Third, you can follow nknews.org and myself on Twitter. For podcast suggestions and feedback, you can tweet at us or email us at podcast at nknews.org. Okay, to introduce my guest today more properly, my guest, Dr. Bernd Schaefer, was global, is global fellow, I'm sorry, with the Cold War International History Project at Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. He has had numerous uh, visiting fellowships and professorships at universities around the world. We'll put a link up to his bio in the show notes. Uh, but he was in Seoul in 2009 at Kyungnam University's Institute for Far Eastern Studies as a visiting lecturer. Welcome on the show, Dr. Schaefer. Thank you for having me. Now, this uh, in interview came about because I found that you had done some research into the links between the North Korean Security Service and the East German security service known as the Stasi back in the 1980s. Was this information that you found by going into the Stasi archives? Yes, I did a lot of research in the Stasi archives on relations between East Germany and the communist uh, states in East Asia. And uh, at that point, uh, when I did research, not much had been done on North Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were various periods in history where East German and North Korean relations were rather close. Right. Uh, now, later on, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, well, or quite a bit, I suppose, about the 1989 13th World Festival of Youth and Students that was held in Pyongyang. Regular listeners to this podcast will remember that back in 2019, for the 30th anniversary of that festival, I did a number of uh, episodes interviewing people who were there and also people who had done research on that. Uh, it's certainly a topic of interest uh, to me, and so I'm glad to be able to look at that once again in the framework of uh, cooperation between the security services of North Korea uh, and East Germany. So I guess let's start uh, with a, a short history of the Stasi. Tell us a little bit about it from its founding to the dissolution of, uh, of East Germany. Yeah, the East German <clears throat> Stasi or state security was um, established in 1950 and lasted all the way up to 1990, early 1990. Foundation was basically under the patronage of the KGB. Uh, for the first couple of years, KGB advisors were uh, pulling all the strings, but this uh, gradually changed. Um, basically, uh, there was a continuity within the Stasi with the same minister in charge, Erich Milke, uh, between 1957 and 1989. And uh, this is the period where the Stasi really expanded, developed, and became pretty powerful. Force. Uh, before that, they had two experiences where things uh, got a bit wrong in 53 with the uprising in East mm. Germany in 56 with all this turbulences. But then from 57 on, they had quite a plan how to uh, expand and structure <clears throat> the entire security system. It's quite remarkable that for more than 30 years, it was under the leadership of one man, as you say, Erich Milke. Milke. Uh, he must have been quite a survivor in, uh, in Communist Party uh, systems. Yeah, I mean, he was a veteran of the communist movement. He actually was involved in communist policies and even uh, actually active as an agent uh, before uh, before the Nazis came to power. So he had quite some standing. He was mm. in the Spanish Civil War. So he had a huge standing. He was personally very close to the leaders, Ulbricht and then Honecker. And he was basically untouchable. Mm. And he used, he used his power to uh, all kinds of methods. Now, uh, both East Germany and North Korea, of course, were uh, set up in the years after the Second World War as, uh, as divided nations under the uh, patronage and influence uh, from the Soviet Union. Until this period in 1989, just generally over the decades, did you find much evidence of there being uh, collaboration and cooperation between the Stasi and the North Korean Boibu? It really didn't start off until pretty late in the uh, communist period in East Germany. 
uh, which is after 1985-86. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, our relations were rather cool, and uh, North Korea was not so much involved with, uh, with East Germany uh, at all. But after 85-86, it changed for two reasons. Yeah, tell us why. What were the two reasons? Uh, one of the reasons were that <clears throat> during that time, gradually, both the Soviet Union and China embarked on some economic reforms, then gradually political reforms, which the North Koreans really considered as a threat to their own system <clears throat> and Kim Il-sung to his own rule. Uh, so they gradually uh, distanced themselves from what was going on in the Soviet Union and in China in order to shield North Korea from any influences on that. This was one reason. The other reason was uh, that uh, came about a pretty close personal relationship between the East German leader Erich Honecker and uh, Kim Il-sung. They were two uh, mutual wizards, state wizards, mm. with a lot of uh, pomp and spectacle in Pyongyang and in East Berlin uh, in 85, 86, and this, of 84, 86. And this, of course, also played an important role when the two leaders are close. A lot of things are suddenly possible that were impossible before. It, it, it reminds me that uh, somewhere uh, in one of my stamp albums, I have a, a commemorative stamp sheet uh, of Kim Il Sung's meetings with and visits to uh, leaders of Eastern European nations. And so there was, of course, Honecker and uh, Ceausescu and uh, two other leaders in there. I, I can't remember the full group that he met, but of course, all of them fell within a number of years after that sheet was printed. You know, let, let's say it was printed in 1988 or 89. Within a couple of years, all of, those, all of them had, had fallen from power with the exception of Kim Il-sung. I really must dig out that stamp sheet and uh, share a photo of it on Twitter. Right, right. Well, obviously, uh, North Korea staged elaborate uh, receptions and spectacles on the stadium when they were foreign hosts, foreign guests. And when Honecker and Ceausescu hosted them, in, uh, in their capitals, they also try to emulate that. I mean, the East Germ the wizard of Kim Il-sung to, to, to East Berlin uh, uh, dwarfs any other wizards by foreign uh, heads mm. of state because East Germany want to pull out all the stops to sort of be able to cope with what the North Koreans were able to set up during their state wizard. Yes. And then, so then we, we fast forward to the, uh, the late 1980s. Uh, this period, as you say, you pointed out that in the mid-1980s, there was some kinds of uh, reforms happening, most uh, no notably in uh, the Soviet Union, of course, the era of, uh, of glasnost and perestroika under the uh, Communist Party General Secretary Gorbachev, and it, even things were happening uh, in the People's Republic of China. Uh, now, in 1988, Seoul here in South Korea hosted the, uh, the Olympic Games. North Korea had first tried to encourage uh, its allies and friends and non-aligned movement countries not to participate in the Seoul Olympic Games, and when it realized that that was impossible, it tried to, uh, to co-host the Olympic Games together with Seoul, uh, and that didn't work out. Uh, and so in 1989, in the summer of 1989, in fact, almost this exact week, it was in July 1989, that uh, Pyongyang hosted the uh, 13th World Festival of Youth and Students as a, as a kind of response or answer to the Olympics, its version of the Olympics. And uh, it's a big event. Um, I, I'm still not exactly sure how many people from around the world went there, because I've seen differing statistics anywhere between 8,000 and 20,000, but certainly we can agree that it was the largest group of uh, young foreign people descending upon Pyongyang ever uh, since the Korean War in 1950. Uh, so it was a huge event, uh, and there was this mingling going on between North Koreans and people from other countries. How did North Korea use it helped from the Stasi to keep order and control over the proceedings of that week-long event. What we can see from the Stasi files is that uh, on the order of Kim Jong-il, uh, the North Korean security services were to approach all Eastern European allies for support in order to help them organize and monitor and manage uh, this event. And apparently only the Stasi was the one really willing to, to, to go all in mm. and offer substantial uh, support, maybe also because uh, the others did not have the uh, substance in terms of technology and manpower to really support them. And as I said before, the Soviet Union and China were not considered as reliable partners by the North right. Koreans at that time. So uh, the East Germans were all then ordered actually by, by their 
uh, political leadership, uh, Honecker, Kim Il Sung, uh, closeness uh, to cooperate and be open and receptive to all North Korean uh, requests. Yeah. And the North Korean requests, uh, the intelligence services requests were quite extensive. And the Stasi tried to, uh, to, to fulfill most of them to, to the best of their abilities. So uh, give us a sense of the, uh, the size, the capacity of the Stasi at that time in July 1989. How big was that organization? Well, East Germany had a population, let's say, of about 16.5 million. Uh, and the uh, East German Ministry of State Security uh, had about 100,000 employees. Uh, this is a huge number in proportion to the yeah. population compared to all other communist states. In terms of informers, uh, East German, on the, at least on the books of the East German Stasi, you had about 180, in 1989, about 180,000 East German citizens on record as being one way or the other in contact with the Stasi as agents or contact persons mm. or whatever. So this is a very high ratio. It's about uh, yeah, 10, 10% of the population. Um, so, yeah. yes, yeah. so the East German Stasi had quite some capacity in intelligence work. And compared to all the other Eastern European states, it has the most advanced technology yes. uh, of all the Eastern Bloc countries because uh, they were able to, 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 to manage to obtain uh, mostly illegally a lot of technology from West Germany and Western countries to use for uh, their Stasi purposes. So when you say technology, are we talking about uh, listening devices, uh, bugs, microphones, secret cameras, that kind of thing? Yes, uh, passport uh, facilities to uh, basically forge passports, mm. uh, monitoring uh, devices, screening devices uh, for um, for airports and train stations. Uh, and this proved also be very important for uh, for North Korea because at at that time in 1989, the airport in Pyongyang were all those up to 20,000 international whispers were uh, going to arrive, uh, did not have the, uh, the terminal facilities to, to screen people. Yeah. And East Germany actually set up the screening uh, technology and helped with them. And basically the same type of technology you had at the East German airport in Berlin Schönefeld. And as I was told, it actually stayed in Pyongyang airport for a couple of years, actually, after 1990. Yeah. before it was replaced later with more modern technology. So I'm curious, did the, uh, what kind of help did the North Korean boy bull request from the Stasi? Was it simply uh, technological aid or did they also request manpower to come and help them uh, and, and any other, what, ideas or, or information sharing? Basically all of the above. What they were mostly worried about, uh, according to the Stasi files, was uh, this influx of about 20,000 foreigners uh, about whom they did not have any information in North Korea. Yeah. Um, so they were very much afraid that some agents working with South Korea uh, would infiltrate uh, those uh, events and uh, create some havoc. So they, they really asked the Stasi to help them with basically checking uh, all the individuals uh, uh, slated for entering uh, North Korea uh, through the Stasi uh, database, the mm -hmm. personal files, file cards. I mean, they were not digitalized at the time in East Germany, yeah, right. so records. they were all file cards. Yeah. So basically, they, they, the Stasi got lists and lists of all kinds of foreigners from all over the world mm. and had to go through their file cards to see whether one of them or some of them might be registered somewhere. Uh, and this was... They, they did that, uh, yeah. but they, they basically found no one in the Stasi files from Ireland or Ecuador or from uh, from Sudan who was actually uh, registered in the Stasi files. But this was one of the main North Korean concerns. We, yeah. we do not know anything about these people. You have to help us to screen them so mm -hmm. we can weed out any South Korean agents. So what you really see through those files is the North Korean paranoia yeah. that South Korea might be up to anything and try to uh, infiltrate uh, um, uh, North Korea uh, via this uh, World Youth Festival. Right. Uh, so as far as you can tell, uh, nobody was weeded out. Nobody was found uh, to be an agent and, and taken from the list. Is that correct? I think between one and five people were actually taken taken ah. out, but, but none else, no. A, a very small handful. And of course, so, uh, listeners of this podcast will uh, remember that there were, in fact, two uh, citizens of South Korea who were present in Pyongyang during the uh, the festival, uh, there was famously the student uh, Im Sugyong, 
the flower of unification who had traveled from South Korea uh, against the law of the South Korean government through uh, East Berlin, through Moscow and on to, to North Korea uh, and eventually spent some, uh, some time, maybe, uh, maybe a whole month uh, in North Korea before crossing over the, the demilitarized zone uh, and being arrested. She spent three years in jail, later on became a politician uh, and was uh, elected to the National Assembly as a proportional representative. So she's had a, a very interesting life. Uh, and then also in the stadium was uh, Pak Chol On, who was a, a, a public servant of the South Korean government, who was a secret emissary sent from uh, South Korea to have meetings with his North Korean counterpart, Han Shi He, many times in Pyongyang. So there were two people there, uh, but neither of them were, uh, well, both of them were welcomed as guests of uh, the North Korean state. Right. This, this is not reflected in the Stasi files, not at all. Right. Uh, did, uh, as far as you can tell from the Stasi files, did the Boibu and the Stasi uh, respect and trust each other, or were they concerned about each other? That's pretty hard to tell because we only have uh, one side uh, mm. of the relationship, uh, which is the East German files. Um, it looks to me that these German officers really consider this as, a, um, as an assignment from above. Um, and they knew they had to fulfill the expectations of the political leadership, which is basically provide the North Koreans with the assistance they request, uh, whether they did this with, uh, with, with conviction or uh, any motivation, it's a bit hard uh, to tell. Um, they, they more or less bureaucratically fulfilled all the assignments, which were substantial. I mean, they had to do uh, all kinds of shipments. Uh, they had to send specialists there and experts. Uh, they sent a pretty large Stasi contingent uh, on site during the entire World Youth Festival to, to, to monitor uh, various things and to liaise with the North Korean uh, counterparts. Wait, so there was actually a group of Stasi agents in Pyongyang uh, wearing, oh, were they in uniform or were they uh, in, in? No, the... no, no. They were, they were under disguise and civilians, civilians and they, I, most of them were, were based at the uh, East German embassy then. Okay. Do you have any idea how many there were in Pyongyang? Um, I mean, are we talking hundreds or, or dozens? No, 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 no. Um, a two-digit two number, I think, roughly about 50 or so. Okay, right. But there were some permanent specialists there to, to monitor the state technological equipment, like at the airport and so on. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it was un under 100 permanently based, yeah. And, and what else have you been able to learn about uh, what they observed or saw during the, uh, the festival? Well, one of their tasks, of course, was to actually monitor the East German delegation, mm. uh, whether, whether any of the East Germans uh, would in, uh, get involved into some activities. Um, well, it was a critical period, as you said before, uh, the World yeah. Youth Festival was in July 89. Yeah. Uh, this was basically one month after Tiananmen uh, in, in, in Beijing. So yes, there were some small protest actions by Western uh, youth delegates uh, from leftist organizations, I think from Sweden or Norway, and yeah, where them posters were shown and uh, uh, yeah, some, some speeches were made about protesting uh, the Tiananmen uh, crackdown. Mm -hmm. And yes, this was something they were worried about. But uh, I think they were mostly concerned whether the East Germans would be involved in that, which was not the case. And also, of course, the North Koreans were very eager to uh, basically uh, shield this from the North Korean population. So in the end, I think both sides, both the North Koreans and the Stasi uh, intelligence were actually very pleased with the event. It went well beyond their expectations. Hmm. And those, those, those little protest actions did not have any resonance with the North Korean population or the, or hmm. the, or the East, German, East German delegations. Yeah. Was there a large uh, delegation of East German youth and students? I'm not fully aware of the of of, of the number, uh, but it basically resembled uh, those of other countries. Uh, there, yeah. there, were, there were quotas, obviously, and uh, then you had such just a certain a certain number. Um, I would also say low low hundred number uh, probably, but they were carefully selected in East Germany. Yeah. They all, in that case, if Sasi had personal files on almost all of them, right. so they they went to quite some some screening uh, before they were allowed actually to go to North Korea. But as you point out, I mean, it was a it was a crucial uh, time. It was a very dramatic year. I mean, 1989, yes, the festival came one month after Tiananmen Square, but also it was uh, just uh, two or three months before the fall of the Berlin Wall. So it was certainly a dramatic, uh, a, a crucial moment in, in history for Germany as well. 
But also you have to say that at that time, uh, nobody, really nobody in the East German leadership expected the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. Uh, same with the North Koreans. So uh, they, they just expect it to be there forever and permanently. So uh, from hindsight, it looks now, well, it was just three months before the fall of the wall, but at that time, nobody expected that. Actually, after the event, the, the cooperation between the, um, the, the, the intelligence services of both countries, uh, East Germany and North Korea, was supposed to get closer Mm. There was a military cooperation. I mean, at that time, you had a lot of military officers in East Germany trained by the East German army. There were extensive plans made all the way up to the 90s about military equipment to be shipped uh, to, to North Korea, about actually East German planes mm. being uh, m- m- uh, maintained in North Korea, sort of some reci- reciprocal, reciprocal arrangements. Um, there were lots of students who were about be about at that time in 89, when, when the war crisis came, there were about 1,500 North Koreans in, in East Germany. Oh. Workers, factory workers, students, yeah. military cadres, and a few intelligence officers too for special training. So during that time, the, the cooperation was very close because both sides expected this would last forever. And North Korea thought East Germany is the most reliable and technologically advanced partner in the communist world we can get. And they really trusted each other. Mm-hmm. So what happened then in fall 89 came as a huge shock for both. Yes, and we, we might be able to uh, to come back to that uh, a little bit later on in the interview. I want to ask, uh, what happened to the Stasi agents uh, in East Germany after the fall of East, the East German state, after unification? I heard in uh, an interview with another Stasi researcher, Dr. Douglas Selvage, who talked about how Stasi veterans helped each other and pushed back against attempts to shame them or punish them. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the Ministry of State Security was uh, completely dissolved in 1990, and there were basically all those 100,000 people, which were not just case officers and, uh, and, 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 and other personnel, but also cooks and drivers and whatever, uh, were basically pushed into unemployment um, with a very uh, low. Uh, uh, pension payments, they were lowered by law, so they actually punished that. So they basically had to look for each other in a way to, to, to make ends living uh, and to, to get to other businesses. And since the German law uh, did not allow them when they were employed with the Ministry of State Security to join any professions which are linked to the vast civil service in, in, in Germany, uh, they basically had to find jobs like uh, like lawyers, uh, like, uh, like businessmen, like uh, insurance agents or real estate agents or stuff like that. So yes, many Stasi, former Stasi officials uh, founded some small businesses and tried to support each other uh, economically. That's one thing. And the other ha- and the other main reason for that was to basically keep them quiet because mm-hmm. it was, uh, the, main, the main motivation was to keep them from basically going over to the enemy, selling knowledge, internal knowledge uh, for agent uh, names uh, for money uh, and basically going over to the enemy. Which the is enemy the West being uh, West Germany? West Germany. West Germany is the enemy and basically stays the enemy also in United Germany. <clears throat> and you're not supposed to sell your knowledge to the, to the enemy. And for that reason, you have to uh, be able to be economically uh, sustainable mm-hmm. to sustain yourself so you don't need money uh, for, for making ends meet. Wow. And do we know, is that still uh, going on? Is there still a, uh, a publicly active uh, group of former Stasi agents? They, fo- they also had some uh, public relations uh, groups where they, they, they founded a small publishing house. And yes, they, uh, they have informal groups where they even publicly uh, meet and discuss certain subjects where they mm. have lectures, uh, of course, uh, mostly just uh, uh, channeling out their, their, their own views on all that. So yes, they also did some PR work among themselves in order to set a counterpoint mm. to the narrative uh, which came out of the Stasi uh, archive. Yes, uh, you still have some groups here or there, but now, of course, it's about uh, 30 years after unification. So many officers are uh, older, some are, mm. others are no longer alive and uh, just have moved on to other things. So this has now abated. But for the first 10, 20 years, they also tried to do some, actually some public uh, counter-offensive yeah. uh, through publications, lectures, and books, yes. Ah. And were, 
Were there many uh, Stasi agents who were uh, prosecuted um, for their activities during the, uh, the East German regime? Yeah, this is an interesting subject. They were basically prosecuted only if they actually broke East German law or if they uh, well committed crimes against West Germans or if they committed crimes against humanity, mm -hmm. um, which in was in that case involved into the, um, the shootings, the shoot to kill orders at the walls, mm. or some of the very few killings uh, that occurred uh, during the period of the GDR. Uh, they were prosecuted when they uh, worked with West Germans uh, who were as agents who were considered as traitors. But in those cases, mostly the West German traitor was sentenced according to West German law, but the East German case officer uh, was basically uh, set free. And if you committed the crime according to GDR law, which is still where murder was still a crime, sometimes it happened uh, through certain, let's say, treatment in Stasi prisons uh, where, where, where people were hurt or sometimes even killed. And that, of course, was even to East German, uh, by East German standards, a crime. But more or less, uh, a transitional justice at the time looked at the existing law in the respective state at the time. Mm -hmm. And in East Germany, many things were legal. Uh, and even mandated uh, by, by by official policy, which uh, which West Germany uh, would not have accepted. But there was basically no legal way to to, to prosecute uh, certain activities in East Germany without completely bending the law or just doing a completely retroactive retributive justice. Right. So so if I understand correctly, then that that even in the uh, unified Germany, uh, East German. Stasi agents were judged according to the East German law that was active at the time that they were working for the Stasi. Right. So unless they they, they were really involved into some criminal uh, activities which were mm -hmm. illegal in East German law or which were actually maybe committed on West German soil, that's a different story. Right. Uh, but if this uh, wasn't the case, uh, there was basically no prosecution of uh, Stasi officers of any kind. Ah. Now, what about... Uh, West Germans who were working as agents for the Stasi. Yeah, I mean, they uh, committed uh, a crime according to West German law because uh -huh. this was considered treason if you spy for a foreign power. Yep. And yes, and those, and those people were all uh, put on trial. Um, many of them actually received very lenient sentences because uh, the East German Stasi did them a last service and destroyed most of the files they had on mm. those West German agents. Mm. So in many cases, you only had a few very uh, uh, small paper trail left. So it was pretty mm. hard to, to build a conviction on that. But yes, they were all charged at least. Right. Uh, right. When there was a file card on a West German working for the Stasi, this person was charged. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in most cases, uh, it, it never uh, came to court, uh, but they were basically all put on notice that they committed uh, something illegal here. Yeah. I guess it's worth pointing out that the uh, uh, the legal difference here uh, between the, the German case and the Korean case is that the two Germanys uh, recognized each other as governments and as countries. And so that's why it's, I guess it's possible in United Germany to still apply East German law to to crimes committed during the, uh, the existence of East Germany. Whereas in Korea, uh, both Koreas do not recognize the other Korea and each Korea um, maintains that it has legal jurisdiction over the entire Korean Peninsula. Uh, so the difference, I guess, in that case would be that which, whichever Korea survives unification will be the one to apply its law retroactively to all Koreans, perhaps. Yes, you basically will have victor's justice in Korea, whoever mm -hmm. will be the victor, in case uh, one of the uh, two Korean states would, would collapse. Yes, obviously. But... Right. That's a, that's a huge difference to the German situation. That's quite different, yeah. What do we know about the sheer volume of the paper archives of the Stasi in East Germany? Yeah, they were vast. Um, uh, there was an estimate uh, put out in the early 90s by the Stasi archive that if you would put all those paper files, and of course they were all paper files, we really talk about the pre-digital age here, mm. um, uh, if you put all paper files uh, next to each other, they would stretch over a length of 180 kilometers. Mm. So that's quite quite a distance. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if you have about, in this case, uh, 40 years, uh, you can really amass a vast amount of, uh, of paper. 
and uh, in the in the Korean case, uh, it certainly wouldn't be less. Of well, that's right. Most... I mean, North Korea has existed for thirty more years than uh, right. East Germany. Uh, we don't really know much about the degree of digitization of the bureaucracy in North Korea, but I think it's probably quite low compared to South Korea. Uh, and and their paper archives must be huge. I mean, there must be just buildings devoted to housing these paper archives. Yeah, I mean, the buildings are still around in, uh, in East Germany. They are, of course, now used for, for different purposes, but just judging from the size of the buildings, uh, you can imagine how many buildings you probably would have to be built in North Korea to house all yeah. those paper files. As a historian and a researcher, what advice would you give to people going into North Korea in the future immediately after some kind of transformation event? I mean, uh, what I'm getting at is what should be done to safeguard and protect the archives of the North Korean state security apparatus? In the East German case, we had uh, opposition activists and demonstrators basically going into the buildings of mm. the Stasi and trying to seal them and uh, and guard them uh, so that the Stasi officers would not be able to take too much out uh, mm. or destroy stuff or burn stuff and so on. So yes, I think one of the main uh, tasks in that case would be basically to seal the buildings, to guard the buildings uh, and monitor them uh, so that uh, there is no chance uh, for, well, not much of a chance for the uh, employees of the uh, security organs to destroy files. So securing them uh, early on is a very important uh, task and right. then basically put them under some, some, some special assignment uh, with, uh, with guards and, uh, and police and all that. Because the Stasi did actually succeed in destroying some shredding and burning some records, didn't they? To, yeah, but but uh, to a surprisingly small extent. Mm. Uh, yes, they did. But uh, that, of course, now we're also in a different uh, age again. But yeah. the technology, uh, let's say, of shredders <laughs> was really not really very much developed. Uh, many of them uh, broke. Uh, they, they, in the end, they, they were resorted to some burning Mm. Uh, which then actually led to the storming of Stasi buildings because you could see the smoke coming out of the chimneys and yeah. then people sense something is going on here. Right. In other cases, Stasi officers took files home. Mm. Yes, but, 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 but still, they could basically only grab what they were still working at, and basically yeah. the stuff they had in the offices. But the archives uh, mm. were so vast, so mm. uh, their, their first concern was to get uh, to get rid of all the files uh, still in in operation, right, the, the operative files, files uh, the, the working files, and uh, and even the, in that case, they they didn't succeed this much. So so yes, uh, the experience shows as soon as something happens like mm -hmm. a collapse, uh, uh, time is of the essence to to get to these buildings first. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, there might be a major difference uh, in, the, in with regard to East Germany. Surprisingly, also to the opposition activists, the Stasi did not fight back. Mm. I mean, Stasi officers all had personal guns yeah. uh, in the offices, uh, but but there was surprisingly no fight put up at the time. Mm. Maybe because it was after the fall of the wall when those buildings were seized. Right. Maybe because Stasi officers realized uh, the end game is already there and makes no sense to, yeah. to to put up some resistance here because we're going to lose anyway. So right. uh, just makes no sense to uh, resort to violence. But that's that's of course a different. Uh, thing, uh, how much uh, firepower is involved yeah. with those buildings if you try to seize them. And I guess that's one uh, good thing about uh, paper archives is that, uh, yes, their, their, their volume is huge and it, uh, they, they weigh a lot, so you need to have very strong buildings to, to be able to house them in. But the, the good thing is that uh, it takes a long time to destroy paper documents if you have an archive like that, as we learned in uh, as you said there in, in East Germany, those shredding machines broke down. People couldn't burn things fast enough. If you try and burn large amounts of paper very quickly, you often find that just the top sheets of paper are burnt and the bottom ones are not burnt successfully. So it, 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 even if they can destroy some of the archives, a lot of them will be left untouched. Yes, I mean, that's certainly the lesson from the East German experience. Um, I mean, in the end, they were, they were actually tearing paper uh, pages uh, apart and put, yeah. them, put them in huge sacks. Yeah, which in the German case were actually then restored and puzzled together yeah. uh, in years of work. So we have many files now restored because, let's say, a 
one, one, one sheet of paper was torn into eight pieces, so people puzzled it together later on. Right. I remember reading about that in the, the late 1990s, early 2000s, that there were these these women in, in this room who, whose job was to put these pieces of paper together. They were called the puzzle women, and uh, they did it by hand. But now with, with digitalization and, and uh, artificial intelligence, it can be done much faster through uh, electronic means. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. Now, I'm going to ask you the question that uh, surely every German researcher who is focused on East Germany gets asked when they come to Korea. Uh, what lessons should South Korea take from the East German uh, experience? Yeah, that's a vast topic. And obviously, it's being discussed in uh, South Korea uh, since 1989. Um, I'm also aware that South Korean researchers, academics, as well as the South Korean government agencies have done a lot to research uh, in the East German archives, to talk to East Germans, to talk to West Germans. So I would expect at this time there's a huge amount of expertise in South Korea or let's say the Korean Institute for Unification about the East German experience and what lessons can we draw from, from that. I would, I would advise in those cases, uh, always first look at the differences between the South Korean, North Korean situation compared to the East German uh, uh, West German situation. And when you have identified the quite significant differences, we mentioned some of them before, like there was no mutual recognition, for instance, mm. or there is no mutual recognition of the two Korean states. Um, well, once we have identified the, the differences, uh, then uh, we can actually look at the possible commonalities or lessons uh, that can be drawn. Of course, uh, the end of uh, communist East Germany was a collapse. Um, then, of course, uh, South Korea should ask what would be a possible scenario of a, a Korean unification. Uh, would it be a collapse of the North Korean system? Uh, or would it be something something else, <laughs> something gradual, something maybe even mutual? Uh, this is pretty hard, uh, pretty hard to tell. Um, the East German example shows that the collapse can occur, is manageable, uh, and can occur peacefully if mm. uh, reason prevails and cool heads prevail and both sides actually uh, show some restraint. Um, whether that will be the case uh, in the Korean uh, case uh, is, uh, is, is difficult to say, but in East Germany, you had really sort of a culture of restraint. The demonstrations were first very tentative in their demands and very uh, sort of respectfully even. It took a while. There was, there was basically no, almost no point where there was a danger of escalation or violence or, mm. or fighting. But if you have a scenario where there are fights, yeah. And uh, and gunshots. Uh, then you, of course, in a completely uh, different uh, situation. And this will, of course, and also affect uh, actually the transition. Then, I mean, if if, if it's a violent transition, mm. uh, you can expect also pretty harsh uh, uh, retroactive justice uh, after after such an event. If it's a manageable, peaceful uh, transition, of course, it's a different situation. But it's very hard to tell for the Korean. Uh, situation. You can never tell how a collapse will actually occur. No. Do you believe that this peacefulness and restraint that were the hallmarks of the, the transition in East Germany was because the people of East Germany were ready for change by September 1989 and all that was needed was some kind of event to trigger that change? I think it was also the, the um, realization within the state and security apparatus uh, that uh, the end is, is is, is coming. There's no way to uh, to to put up a last stand, which you will lose in any case. Mm. So you have this pragmatic approach. Just try to get the best out for yourself and for your institution, and uh, and and basically uh, give up instead of uh, putting up a fight that you're going uh, going to lose. And yeah, and you had the example before in in China in June '89. That would be a fascinating story. How this was perceived in East Germany by the state apparatus as well as by the population. Uh, so though this type of violence mm. uh, is something I think both sides also wanted to avoid, where the people were afraid of the government might pull up a Chinese solution, yeah. but the government was not interested in pulling up something like that because they know what this would have entailed. In the end, they would have lost it, uh, but at a terrible price. Mm. Do you think as an observer that uh, 
that something is, has been missing in North Korea? I mean, I, I guess what I'm asking is, what is it that has enabled North Korea to, uh, to continue on in this way for the last 30 years after the collapse of the, the Soviet Union and, uh, and all the East German, sorry, East European uh, socialist systems? I think more or less, uh, they have been very effective of shielding uh, not just their territory, uh, but also their uh, their population from uh, from foreign influences. Um, mm. uh, this is also a huge difference to the to the German situation where you had a travel legal travel going back and forth between East and West Germany. We had all kinds of exchanges, even official exchanges going on, where you could actually watch in eighty percent of East Germany regular West German television. Mm. Uh, if if something like that would be the case in North Korea. Just imagine, eighty percent of North Koreans would be able daily to watch South Korean TV. Yeah. Uh, just imagine what impact this would have on people, how they would think about life in South Korea, how they would think about uh, whether they might be able to have access to the same kind of uh, um, material goods you see uh, uh, just on that uh, TV set, or what you what you can see on, on ads and advertising and all that. And, you would right. see the huge differences between society. And I think that more or less North Korea has been extremely, of course, ruthless, uh, obviously, but very successful in shielding the population from that. And with regard to South Korea, I'm not sure whether actually in all those past years, everything was done in that respect, which would have actually facilitated uh, the knowledge of North Koreans about South Korean society in a legal way or legal manner. I mean, I don't, I don't want to talk about sending balloons over their propaganda material, no, but the airwaves, uh, mm. of course, play an important role. And now we have also digitalization and we have phones and internet and all that, whether something more could have been, been, been done. One of the main reasons of the undoing of East Germany, I think, was the, the knowledge mm. about the standard of living in West Germany. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, the, the notion that East Germany is falling more and more behind mm in terms of standard of living compared to West Germany. And then they were having this, of course, this attitude, we are also Germans. Mm. We are East Germans, but uh, we are also Germans. And in a way, we are entitled yeah. to the same, what you see over there. Mm. But in order to get there, you first have to change your government, obviously. Yeah. And whether we have this attitude in Korea, this is, of course, not identical in Korea, but this is a, an important question whether North Koreans would perceive themselves as saying in a way we are all Koreans in a way we are entitled to the to, to the best possible life yeah. and if there is one part of Korea that enjoys this uh, um, uh, very affluent uh, way of life we are also entitled to it in order to get that we have to do something about it mm. but in order to do that first you have to know about it and the, the question is even today to what extent of the North Korean population people inside North Korea are really aware of the huge economic difference uh, between the two Koreas. Yeah, yeah. I remember many years ago uh, here in Seoul, I went to see uh, Lothar de Maizière, uh, interim leader of, of East Germany speak. And uh, when he was asked about uh, what it is that's needed in North Korea, he said that it, they need information, uh, information about life outside North Korea, specifically in South Korea, but also the rest of the world. Yes, I think he's absolutely right, because this was in the end, let's say, the undoing of communist Germany, uh, that the leaders were not able and or willing to basically shield uh, their population from information coming from the outside. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was not possible for them to do it, and then they tried to, to cope with it. They think they could live with it, but in the end, they were not able to manage it anymore. And that might be the lesson that the leaders of, uh, of North Korea have learned from the East German situation is that they've been much more successful in, uh, in keeping a firewall between North Korean citizens and the rest of the world. And that, uh, you know, yes, many North Koreans nowadays have uh, smartphones uh, and they have access to information, but that's all internal in North Korea. There's no, uh, there's very, very, very few North Koreans who have access to the Internet. Right. And as, as far as I've, I've read, you're also getting punished if you're getting caught by, let's say, have a watch party of, a, of South Korean uh, mm. uh, soap opera on, on your phones or so. Yeah. Um, so um, so the, the, the monitoring in North Korea, of course, is, is still much more effective than it was uh, 
mm. in in East Germany. And uh, yes, if I if I would be in the North Korean leadership, I would also take this conclusion from uh, from the East German situation. Uh, the more information coming in uh, from the outside, the more precarious your uh, your hold on power is. And uh, yes, and probably they 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 take the opposite uh, uh, lesson from that. Yeah. As well as China, China does to some respect, of course, as well. China also, that's right. Now, in the show notes for this episode, I'm going to uh, put up a link to a piece that you wrote for the uh, the Wilson Center uh, called North Korea and the East German Stasi, 1987-1989. Uh, you wrote that piece back in uh, in 2017, and that's um, when the bulk of your research was wrapped up. Um, do you know? Are you aware of any research that has been done of the Stasi in the Stasi archives about uh, North Korea since that time? Well, actually, I'm I'm not, and uh, also I'm not quite uh, familiar with all the research going on in in, in Korea itself. Right. Uh, but I would recommend to to any uh, Korean or or foreign scholars uh, to 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 look at that uh, period and uh, the, the various aspects of the collaboration between Stasi and North Korea, because probably this is the only archive in the world where mm. you have at least some insights, of course, they're only glimpses, but some insights into the, uh, the structure and mechanisms and workings of North Korean uh, intelligence, through, of course, through the uh, lens of uh, the East Germans, because you will never see any of those files in North Korea and that uh, collapse. You will not see any of those files in uh, in, in in Moscow or Beijing, mm. and in other Eastern European capitals, you never had this close cooperation as you had between the TDR and North Korea. So, I think we can only encourage scholars in the future who uh, want to have an interesting uh, research topic yeah. uh, to 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 look at that. And um, I'm happy to support anyone who is, who is willing to 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 take this on. That's a great public appeal. I completely second uh, your emotions there. I would like to ask anybody out there looking for a good research topic, get in touch with Dr. Ben Schaefer to uh, to research the Stasi archives about uh, the issue of North Korea East German cooperation. There's there's obviously much more to be uh, to be done in that area, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And you can still talk to people. There might be witnesses around mm. uh, in East Germany who might be willing to talk about that. You had quite a substantial number of East Germans who went to North Korea at the time. Mm. Uh, so uh, many of them are still alive. So it might actually be really worth uh, to do some research here. Are you aware of any of the um, 1,500 approximately uh, North Koreans who were in East Germany at the time of the changes, uh, if any of them stayed in Germany? There must have been some. Yes, I actually, I'm, I was in East Berlin 1990 summer, mm -hmm. which is uh, about a couple of months after the fall of the wall, we actually met one. Wow. <laughs> he stayed. Uh, I, I, I think they have. There were a small number of, of Koreans who, who made it. Uh, North Koreans who made it to the west, mm. um, and then uh, must have stayed. Yes, um, I, I I know from the files there were about one thousand five hundred. Uh, the North Korean embassy was was frantically trying to ferret them out as soon as possible yeah. uh, in November eighty nine. Uh, but I'm not sure they succeeded with everyone. But of course, the bulk of them had been uh, had been returned. But I think, particularly among the students, uh, I'm sure some of them saw, somehow managed to stay in the West. Mm. And that former uh, that embassy in former East Berlin that is now still the North Korean embassy in United Germany, isn't it? Right. So, so, so basically, uh, the the East German embassy in Pyongyang was was was, was closed in 1990. Yeah. And then there were no diplomatic relations between United Germany and North Korea until 2001, if mm. I am correct. But now they are, for a couple of years, of course, now they are diplomatic relations again between North Korea and uh, and, uh, and Germany. And yes, they're using the old uh, North Korean embassy, which is a pretty large compound, actually. And right. it's, uh, it's also used for all kinds of commercial purposes because the embassy is having a hostel there to to make some money for North Korean business leaders. Fascinating. Uh, now, uh, uh, Dr. Schaefer, are you on Twitter? I'm just wondering how people can keep up with your present or more recent research. Uh, no, unfortunately not. Um, okay. But uh, the, the best way to get in touch with me is by, by, by email. You want me to provide an email address? Uh, if you're comfortable with that, uh, I'm happy for you to say it on the podcast. Yeah, just use my name, Bernd.Schaefer. 
S-C-H-A-E-F-E-R, brand.shafer at yahoo.com. Okay, and we'll put that uh, in the show notes as well so that uh, prospective researchers can get in touch with you if they're interested in, in doing more uh, digging into the Stasi archives. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time today, Dr. Bernd Schaeff. It's been fascinating talking to you and learning a little bit uh, of the insights into uh, the collaboration between the North Korean Boibu and the East German Stasi. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Excellent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of today's podcast. If you already have an NK News subscription, you could take a look at our NK Pro platform which offers unparalleled services specifically catering to the needs of professionals who monitor developments on the Korean Peninsula. You can inquire about access and a free trial membership by emailing membership at nknews.org today. Also, if you have any feedback or questions or guest recommendations, please email us at podcast at nknews.org. Our thanks, as always, go to Arias Dare and Brian Betts for facilitating this episode and to Gabby Magnuson, our post-recording producer genius. Thanks very much and listen again next time.